most entrepreneurs don't have discovered their own personality, who they are, and or they're just afraid of being their real selves. John is an American entrepreneur, top 1% growth consultant and business master. His wealth of actual knowledge is impacting the masses. People will naturally buy if they actually have legit real trust with you. We forget we are talking in all communication one-on-one -on -one to a human. Look at Liquid Death. While they have a very unique cam, in the end, their offer is still water. But they're now a multi-billion dollar company, one of the biggest water companies in the world. What do they have? Definitely the coolest one. Brand slash marketing design. I used to not believe in brand, but brand doesn't exist. I slowly <laughs> am realizing what makes your offer perform better than anyone else's from my experience. The Content Capitalist Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Content Capitalist Podcast. Today, my guest is somebody who actually I feel a connection with in a certain way because he's a second generation entrepreneur. He worked with his father, built up a business right now. The business he's focused on is profitalized, but he's done a lot more than that. And from what I see online, you've helped your clients generate over $300 million in sales. And uh, I want to welcome John Weberg to the show. John, welcome. Thank you so much for the amazing intro. I, I appreciate the kudos and I'm sure we'll go through a lot of unpacking to give people an insights to this young kid who is not doing too shabby. Yeah, not not bad at all. Look, you've, you've done quite a bit. And uh, from the looks of it, you're still very young. Uh, if you're listening on the audio, guys, please do check out the YouTube channel. So then you can see just uh, how young he is. And you might be surprised when we talk about what, what he's actually been able to accomplish. But I've got a question I want to start this off with. Okay, so you're a published author, right? You've run three successful businesses. You've spoken at global events. And you did all this starting out from 10 years old, working, and then working with your father growing up, and then eventually partnering with him. What were the biggest challenges growing up working with your father in a business space? I think precisely around it being a business space and my age. You know, when you're very young and you're getting started in business, you're a young entrepreneur, it's very difficult to be taken seriously. It's very difficult for people to actually think you know what you're talking about at all because you're so young, because people believe years of experience equals actual experience. And in my case, I've discovered for myself. And when you talk with people, you discover that's not really the reality. Reality is time helps. Years of working and getting people actual good and great results equals actual experience. So, you know, collaborating, trying to speak at events at a really, really young age, literally, you know, 14, 15, 16 years old, I was pitching people, being able to make partnerships, whether it's like JV deals to promote products with each other. That was a huge issue. And just in general, any communication online, especially initially until I've built my name up, has been a humongous struggle to get people to take you, me seriously, to listen to me, to believe I know what I'm talking about, which is why I've had to try to articulate myself. And reduce my excitement because I have tons of energy because maturity is contained. <laughs> what about the interaction between you and your father? I can see how him as being an entrepreneur would want at some level to project that onto the children. There's a bit of identity, like a continuation of, of ambition. And he gets to potentially, you know, do this vicariously through you. And then that would be something. Now, did you ever feel some pressure or like uncomfortable about that? Or was did it feel like support and hand in glove the whole time? Tell me about that. I think a, a mutual, I think both, because fortunately, my dad, since we were really young, I have three brothers, all of us have had the same treatment of a continual standard of where you need to be as a person, as human, let, let alone business and being an entrepreneur and doing great in your life. You know, he was a huge proponent and definitely motivator because we saw how hard he worked. That was number one. We saw how hard our dad worked from. He would get us up at 6 a.m. He'd work all day. He'd be working when we got home from school. He'd work till 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock at night. Repeat, cycle, cycle, cycle. Um, and now lives pretty dang free, completely free from being an entrepreneur. But we saw that grind. He instilled it in us in many different ways, such as making us haul rocks, for literally no reason other than to build work ethic. He would go, hey, kids, what are you guys doing after school? He'd be like, oh, I was just going to watch some TV. He goes, no, come outside, come outside. We have a, I have a small project. It's always a small project, quote unquote. Come out with this small project. You go, oh, it's going to take like 10 minutes? Yeah, yeah, 10 minutes. You go out there and there's a 
you know, probably 500, 700 pounds worth of rocks. He goes, I need you to haul these to the other side of, of the yard. Oh, why? I don't like where they're at. Go ahead and get to it. Stuff like that or another quick scenario that instilled kind of the motivation and like you also, when your dad or a figure does that to you over and over, you actually develop, um, like you're saying, almost like an expectation of yourself and pressuring yourself like, I have to perform for them. I want to go above and beyond because he keeps doing that over and over. Another instance, he took us out to, hey, go shovel the driveway. You know, it snowed. I live in Minnesota. So there's yards of snow that fall. And we were, I believe we shoveled for two hours. He goes, only two hours with that much snow coverage? You need at least another hour. Go back out there. And as a kid, you're kind of like, ah, but you also get it as you age. So I think it was a, it was great. I mean, he's an amazing father. I think having him has been an incredible influence. Unfortunately, not everyone has that type of influence. Sometimes it's too harsh. Uh, sometimes it's not harsh enough. And I think he struck a great balance of, I have high expectations for you, but I've also tried to give you the resources and tools. Now, if you fail that, I'm going to give you a hard time, but enough that you are also motivated to keep doing what you're doing. And in, in business, the first few years, I actually didn't listen to him at all, which was to my failure, my literal failure. So was this while working for him or starting your own business and then kind of being mentored by him? Initially, it was starting my own business between the age of probably 12 to 14, 15. I could almost legally make money online. Is that the one where you're designing websites for people? Designing websites. I had a gaming blog at the time. I had a gaming blog that I was working on and a few other small projects like that. And I was also launching with a kid from school I'd found who knew how to code, but really didn't. I was going to launch my own program, my education and marketing program, which I was not nearly equipped enough to actually even teach. But I launched it and I told my dad, because he t continually would watch me. I convinced my entire grade to create their own websites. I was, you know, always in school and just out of school was- Just hustling, right? Hustling, 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 because I wanted to make him proud. And I also wanted more for myself from my background before getting started in this stuff. Did you ever get called to the principal's office for, you know, that kind of behavior? No, I was a really good kid. So fortunately, no, I almost did a few times though, because I would, I was one of those kids who sold stuff out of my lockers. You don't have to tell me what stuff. We'll, <laughs> we'll just keep that, keep that, yeah. you know, off the record. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, teachers would come by and go, don't sell anything out of your locker. Like, yeah. So I kept it on the low though. But yeah, I was a pretty good kid, but he motivated us a lot. He gave us a lot of inspiration, hard lessons, but also was kind when he needed to be. And the first business failed miserably. So I didn't take any of his advice. I actually said, don't tell me what to do. I'm going to do this on my own. So I could accomplish it myself without any help. As a, a young man with your own ego and your own pride, you want to go above and beyond and show, hey, I can do this. Business failed miserably sunk him. Oh my Lord, this did not work out how I needed it to. Dad, can you teach me a thing or two? And then I started taking his advice and that's when we kind of partnered together. And from 15 onward, things took off and were much more successful. So kind of like a mini prodigal son story here, huh? Yeah, a mini prodigal son among the many prodigal sons. I consider myself the most handsome, the most bald, but... I love that. Now, are you still working with your father or have you completely gone independent now? We do affiliate marketing together. So I think that's something that will probably, thankfully, be always a part of my life that's kept us really close together, that we always... I mean, I talk to him probably two, three times a day, call him on the phone. How's this going? How's the Legion going? How's your projects going? How are my projects going? And I think that will continue on. I see it going on for, you know, another hopefully 10, 20, 30 years. And he loves it. I love it. And it's fortunately kept us really, really close. We actually don't argue about business, more of like, hey, we're going to build a sales page. We're going to build this. What's the best way to do it? That's the, probably the max amount of things we argue about. Otherwise, it's a pretty tight knit relationship that will keep being incredible. I, I, it's great. You know, the reason why I kind of latched onto this when I was researching about you is because my dad was also an entrepreneur, but I didn't really get brought up by him in that way. Like he was an entrepreneur when I was a kid. And when I was a young adult, he decided to start his own business. So that's when I started kind of getting these ideas. And I did work with him for a short amount of time, but I don't think that we would have gotten along very well. No? But uh, no, I don't think so. We have our own ideas. I do respect him a lot, but 
I don't think I could work for. I, I do feel that it's, it's the same. Sometimes, you, yeah, you have your own ideas. It's just not the same while you respect it, and You know, like him. he set up his kingdom uh-huh. and deep down inside, maybe I wasn't ready to admit it to myself, but I want to be king of my kingdom, not a prince in his. I completely see that same vision. But something happened recently. I've got a kid. He's 22 and he just turned 20. Actually, wait, he's 21 turning 22 this year. And when he was in high school after hours, he would, it was just a troublemaker, you know? And me and my wife were like scratching our heads. What are we going to do with this? And I said, hey, look, you got to either go get a job, local 7-Eleven, I don't care what, or you're going to work for me, but you're not going to sit around just blazing around, causing trouble, you know, bugging your brothers and sisters. So he decided to work for me. I taught him how to edit video, just a few hours. He picked it up really fast. After doing that for a while, then, you know, he was just doing it after hours in school. But then when he finished school, he decided to come for work for me full time. And then I had him start to train new recruits, editors. And then I had him start to help with quality control and then project management. And and it kept growing, right? And at one point, I'm like, well, you know, obviously, you need a raise because you're progressing. And then I gave him a choice. I said, I'll either give you a raise, and it, it would have been a comfortable amount, or you could have a percentage of profits. And I lined it up so that at the time, and I showed him all the books, and he'd have full access to it anytime so he knows that there's no funny business going on. But I lined it up so that the percentage of profits would be about half of what he'd get if he settled for a raise. And he went for a percentage of profits, and I was really impressed. That was about two years ago. And as the company's grown with his help, right now he's in charge of hiring. He's in charge of like coaching the team, and performing and things like that. Three days ago to this day, he comes to me like he's beaming. And I said, what's up? And he's just like, you know what? This month, I'm getting paid more than you are. <laughs> and I was just like, that is so beautiful. I am so proud of you. I was so like, and something hit me. I saw a quote. I think it was Alex Hermosi. He put something on Twitter a little while ago. He says, the only person who genuinely wants you to do better than them themselves is your father. And I think that's true. You know, like we all say to each other, like, oh, wow, good for you. But then as they kind of inch past you, like, you know, like you gritted inside. But And it makes you competitive. You know, like, no, no, no I got to out. But I think it's built into our DNA. We want our kids to outperform us in every way. Because that's a continuation of our lineage, and it's also a sign, a testament of of uh, who we were as parents. I think that gives you huge kudos for being a great father. So I, I applaud you for that. And raising such an incredible kid, I think that also attests to you as a person. Because I haven't had children yet, but I know that. Don't worry, you're a, so young. <laughs> I'm still, yeah, I'm sure I'll have many. This plan, I um, kids are. There's so many emotions and you just want the best. For what, what I've gotten from fathers, I've talked deeply with my friends and their fathers. Yeah, you just want the best for them. You almost don't care as long as they're healthy, they're doing well. You, you just want the absolute best for them. And they, they accomplish that. If you're a good dad, you're like, my son, my, product, my, my prodigal son, you're doing it. And it's I, I want to give you a huge applaud for that because that's amazing. I think that the thing that was most impressive for me was when he chose the the more difficult path, but the one that would be pegged to his performance. And that just should, and there were at least three times I can remember where, you know, his income really dipped because business is not a smooth road all the time. And I offered, Hey, you know, like it looks rough this month. Do you want to switch? And he goes, no. And this is like over the past three years, two years, maybe it happened like three times when I offered it and he kept refusing no matter how low it went. So I see that he had the right motivation. Uh, the right motivation, I think, that goes to goes to show what you what you instilled in him, similar to my father, was doesn't matter how if it goes low, higher, whatever. I want to keep proving and stick to my decision because that's what you kind of want from your kids is you want them to stick to who they are, be a good person, even if things get difficult. Continue being the arduous hard worker and strive through it. And I mean, it worked out obviously for you both immensely, and that's that's amazing. Thank you. I want to talk about a few things that I pulled that you put online and just kind of understand what this is about. So on Speaker Hub, you put out, it's not about how many people see your message, it's about how many people take action on it. I, I would support that. I, I'd almost add it's about how you make people feel. Because while business, from my experience, and it just, just having influence from my experience, is about the numbers and metrics and the data reporting and analyzing and split testing and optimization and working on conversions and all those incredible things. 
from my experience, when I've done best in business and in life, and I mean literally any realm from relationships to friendships to anything, it's been from how I'm able to make people feel because that directly correlates to how they relate to you. And if they trust you and want to work with you, buy from you, have a relationship with you and all these other things. So it's something I apply to all of my life as much as possible. It's why I'm such a, or try to be such a positive, energetic, um, enjoyable person to be around because it's infectious. I try to be infectious. And I think in all communication, despite what AI is currently doing, I'm sure it will eventually be able to do it, but people feel you through when you're doing email marketing, emailing your list, through your advertising. If you look at, take a look at the Harmon brothers and the ads they've done, people feel the humor and what went into the work. People feel what goes into all of your business. And most people who are struggling, I think you're way more on the business side and you're less on the people side, less on the feeling side. And that's why you will continue struggling because you're not focusing on how do you make your audience feel who haven't became a customer yet to acquire them as one, your current customers, how do you make them feel to retain them as a customer versus getting more money out of them? But if you give them the best absolute customer experience plausible, they will retain as just based off of loyalty alone. And I think that's missing a lot from business it is, is having true personality and really being your unique self. Because business is professional, quote unquote. Business is different or it's it's normally perceived as different in most people's minds. And how do you like create that persona or, or like what, what part of yourself do you show in a professional environment? And where do you draw the line where like, hey, this is business, this is personal. Let's talk about that. Like, do you ever explore where the line is? I'm constantly exploring where the line is. So if, if people go to my YouTube uh, they'll see I upload some very different videos. I've done videos of chest up, chest up, me in the shower. I've done videos of me doing flips. I've done videos with me. I mean, literally, uh, you've seen The Matrix, I'm sure. Uh -huh. You know, that there's a scene, I forgot his name, where he has the red pill and the blue pill, Morpheus, and he has the two options. I dressed as Morpheus and made a VSL, a sales page out of that. I think... There, there isn't as much of a line as people think because we forget we are talking in all communication one-on-one -on -one, to a human, whether it is a business consultant type person. You know, at the end of the day, when we all hang up, we get up out of our chair and we just have the nice shirt on, but there's you know it's just shorts underneath, and we go about our day with our wives and our kids. We're people, and it, it's really just a relating exercise. All business is relating. Now, in consulting field, uh, in coaching and mentorship. There is some brevity where you need to, there's a light line, a light line where you're professional, but you can still really relate to someone. And I think that also how you find that line is also gauging people's reaction to your content, to your messaging, to when you're talking to them, like we are on a podcast or on a Zoom, being able to clearly identify, are they resonating with this? Are they repeating it? Are they in line with me? Are they nodding their head? You have to be careful in watching that. And becoming an expert at watching that and knowing what people are actually listening to you and agreeing with. Being careful with that is where you, I think you find that play. And then I think as you go more businessy, more B2B, there is less humor. There is less entertainment. There is less of this playful nature. But I think that still, even while it's professional, because I've always gotten that, I've always gotten like, you could be more professional. You could be more structured. You could be more all these different things. I think just above all else, truth, being your real self, that outshines everything. Being professional, quote unquote, because people sense bullcrap very easily. I think more easily than people think. Now, how do you gauge that line? It's off people's reactions. How do you make sure you're fun and exciting, but you're not too above the bar? Um, you can also use data and metrics. So for example, if you're running ads and you're using a really creative model of ads, that is, for example, let's take a look at Squatty Potty, Squatch Soap with the Harmon. Again, look at the Harmon Brothers, what they've done in advertising. Well, it's not B2B, although I think they have done some B2B. Their B2C side is extremely not professional, quote unquote, and it outperforms. I think they charge, I looked at their site, they charge a, a minimum of a million dollars, and I believe it's between like 10 and 40% of all profits to even begin working with you. But their ads, their content, Versus, you know, you take a look at a Avon shampoo commercial versus a Harmon Brothers shampoo commercial. 
some reason, the humorous one that actually relates to people far outperforms a hundred times over. So I think testing, you have to actually test it and be, be okay hitting that line a little bit and stepping over that line, not too far, but just a little bit, gauging reaction, trusting and seeing if the metrics conversions of your advertising, your marketing, your funnels, et cetera, goes up or down. And I think it's difficult to find for most people because most people, most entrepreneurs don't have discovered their own personality, who they are, and or they're just afraid of being their real selves because they think that if they're not the exact professional they're expected to be, that that's somehow going to affect business negatively. In most cases that I've seen, that's never been the case because I've worked with some pretty successful clients that have only loved me for this personality that I'm always showing. Yeah, thanks for that. I was looking at my computer here because I was trying to remember when, but we had Shane Rickard, the CEO of Harmon Brothers on here not too long ago. And so if you're listening to this, go to the show notes. We'll put a link so you could go jump straight to that one. And you're really right. It's They do have the ability to connect with people, not through you know statistics and data, but through storytelling and actually caring more about how the person feels about the experience of watching you than about the data that they're, you know, that you want to present or or trying to convince them to go click the button, you know, click the button, make it bigger, make it redder. Right. There's way less split testing analytics and trying to hammer down the benefits and hammer down the pain points. It's all about literally just like you're saying, relating so closely because again, who do we all want to buy from? You want to buy to someone who you can like, know, and trust the basis of all business, of all relationships, of all communication. And what builds that is not being professional. And I mean, that's a part of it that can help being professional while humorous, being professional while entertaining, while building connection. That's the best way to do it. I think though, when you really hammer down on the strong points of what being real does, it just relates to people's heart, their soul, their mind, which is like you're saying, hard to analyze, hard to put into metrics, but it just performs better because we like real stuff. We, you know, until AI gets good enough and it's getting close, we like real, real people because you can sense when something, it's it's like a sixth sense of sensing when someone's communication is off, it's a little too slow, it's too fast. It's You can tell when things are measured and how you try to express yourself to the world. I think another way to look at this too is, you know, some people are afraid like, hey, if I am too much of myself, then some people are going to get scared away or even like not like me. And I think the truth is that, yes, that is true. Some people will. However, what's going to happen is that like, especially if you're in the services industry, imagine having to work with someone who doesn't like your personality and you always have to pretend to be that person that you were in the ad. Like that would suck, right? That would suck more than they just flick off your ad or, or your social media and they never connect with you. Like maybe you have fewer, but you have a better quality of life. Or maybe you'll have more because more of the kind of people who relate to you see that it's like, oh, I didn't know there was someone just like me. I want to you know, go find out more about that person. So you will detract people, at, but... You want to. I think you, you want to. But you will also attract. There's two sides, you know? Yeah, the two sides is you want to get rid of people who, one, you're not going to actually enjoy working with. And that aren't going to be actually be fun, great, perfect. You know, not, you're not always going to get perfect, but good projects. And whether it's your personality and having to hide it, whether it's, but see, I also have a theory that that's represented in multiple ways though. And that's the same with a client. So if you feel things, something is off with a client, for example, that feeling actually represents there's something different with the personality that's giving you an ick, you know, an ick, quote unquote, giving you something that's, it's an actual warning sign to be very cautious when working and so on. And a, a good example of, I guess, B2B done right in a humorous, fun way. If you look at Billy Jean is marketing or Genius, the stuff he does, he serves B2B. He, he has an agency that serves businesses. All of it, I've almost all of his ads I've seen are extremely humorous. He dressed up as Willy Wonka, people who are familiar with gaming. Uh, he pretended he was very recent one, and I'm talking about it, which is why you can tell it's good. Uh, on the podcast, he pretended he was in uh, a video game called Grand Theft Auto, and he was the main character going through it. That was an ad that serves all business owners. So I think what people also have to realize is the vast majority of people like yourself are looking for a some kind of personality, something different to stand out, to latch onto. Think about every commercial you see that you don't remember. Why don't you remember it? Because there was no personality. There was no feeling to it. 
and I'm having a hard time thinking of one. Right, because you, you, you literally can. Like, what comes to mind is like hair commercials. And maybe it's because I'm not a female, but get the lockiest locks with the silky smooth, uh, new texture. And you name the commercial, the, the average commercial, it's why the Super Bowl stands out. It's because they actually put effort into maximum emotion. All the ads people remember, I know there's the Budweiser one, the Budweiser frogs, Budweiser. There's the horse ones that people, oh my God, the horses. It was so gecko. sad. The gecko, the Geico gecko. I think it's actually necessary, especially if you're a small business, you have to instill personality into your business. I got to say the Doritos ones were always my favorite when they had the contests and they didn't even make it, man. That was so brilliant. They had anybody could submit and they just pay one person, but they get access to you know thousands and thousands of ads. <laughs> right. That can go, oh my God, imagine me able to spot test all those. And there's so many you could do with that. Um, yeah. And that's where people, I think the creative side of business and I don't like it because while AI can make business easier in so many ways, I think half of people will either use it in a great way and it'll enhance their business and they'll find a way to integrate the personality into it. But I think I would say the mass is people using AI for writing articles, for doing many different things. They're going to find that their business actually struggles more. They can produce results, not results. They can produce items and deliverables faster but actually getting real results, I think it comes from that personality and having some of that to instill in your work. And that's why all of the goats, all of the greats of anything are like they are. Like we talked earlier about like Frank Kern, for example, that I worked with. I was his head sales consultant. Frank Kern, when you say his name, people who know him has this instant relatability, funny, humorous, kind of hippie-like guy that people just love because of his just his personality. People buy from him. And I know because I was on his, I was a sales guy just because of that alone. I got something here that uh, you said, I was published with Apple, and uh, you said, automate, delegate, and eliminate. Your business will never grow until you focus on the activities that truly matter. I'm guessing that you said this and also had an experience in your business with this. Could you just talk about what experience you had like that? Yeah, so as business has grown, as I've developed over the years, which I still have a lot to learn, you know, I've worked with some really cool people, but they're still a lot of different hacks and tricks and things for long-term growth and things with hiring to learn. But in general, what I've learned in business is to, especially as your time becomes more valuable, especially as your business grows faster and faster and faster and faster, you need to find, especially as a CEO owner, even like a CMO and CFO and stuff is, in my experience, the activities that will produce the largest results possible, the shortest amount of effort needed. Whether it's hiring, whether it's delegating, different tasks, different people on your team that you don't want to handle, whether it is another thing, for example, like thinking through, say, if you're, if you're a solopreneur and you're thinking through, what should I do today? You know, I need to send out emails to my list. I need to create content. There's all these different things that you can do. Really, again, asking yourself, what's the, the quickest t task I can complete that will bring me the most business the fastest? Well, what brings in the most business the fastest? Number one, for example, solopreneurs, a lot of them are stuck in, I need to acquire more individual customers. For me, I'd say that's a waste of time. What you should be doing is trying to find one partnership that can bring in 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 customers in one go. For example, with like Profitalize, for example, it's a basically a all-inclusive, anything you want to learn about starting, growing, or scaling a business, almost university and education platform, put all into one. So regardless of where you're at, you can use the education on the platform. The way I form partnerships is, for example, with a company like Tailwind. Tailwind is a social media marketing CRM of sorts. Instead of me ever going after an individual customer, my activity is better spent or me delegating it to someone else on my team to go find and work closely to get one single partnership with Tailwind, with a CRM, with someone who has business owners who are looking to grow their business who could use my education because they have this amazing tool. It's a perfect partnership mashup together. Another example is, you know, other than running paid ads, you know, my time creating content needs to be either delegated or I should be doing something like going on podcast. What's the piece of content I can create that gets the largest amount of views in the shortest amount of time? So think about, you know, creating a YouTube video. If you have a smaller channel, YouTube video might get not that many views for one to two to three to five, depending on how long it takes you to cut, edit, record a video, many hours versus going on a podcast where Thankfully, 
again, all of the podcast hosts take care of all the heavy lifting for you. You're in front of, hopefully, the right audience. It's edited. You are made to be authoritative. And you're in front of quite a few people. So that's where I tell people whether you're a beginning entrepreneur or whether you're doing six, seven figures or doing eight figures, great. You know, wherever your level is at, and even if you're a part of a business, if you're the CMO or you're the email marketing manager, it doesn't matter. Wherever you are at in a business, you need to do what is going to bring in the most business in the shortest period of time with the least amount of effort. And by doing that and really focusing on bigger deals, what Grant Cardone gets right with as much hate as he gets is making bigger deals and spending time on those is a little hack to getting the results you want in your business a lot faster. It's interesting you bring up Grant because uh, right after you, I've got not Grant, but Grant's business partner, the one who he has a, another education program that he's tied up with. So yeah, it's interesting. It's a small world. Now, I want to circle back. Like the question I asked, I want to ask one specific thing that was the biggest mover for you in those three things. Something you used to do manually, but now you automate. Something you used to do, but now it's delegated. Something that you completely eliminated. Like, let's get real in your business career. What is that? Okay, automate, delegate, um, automation of content creation. So I don't edit any more of my content at all. It's all done by an agency because you need to be careful with working with agencies. Before I tell people quickly, before you delegate, say you find an agency, you find a coach, you find someone to help you automate a lot of your business, such as content creation, because the time that goes into that is insane. You have to be very careful with who you choose. Literally anyone you choose to delegate work to, find their testimonials, and contact those people individually and ask about their actual real experience. Because I've had some really bad experiences with agencies, losing $50,000 with SEO agencies that generated zero increase in traffic, website visitors, any metric. And I've had some good experiences. Um, so A, with my content, because content editing, really, especially if you're a business owner and you're making anything above $10,000 a month, probably even less than that, depending on where you live and your situation, you need to have someone, if you're making content, you stop editing your content. You can find very, very affordable options, literally on Fiverr, on Indeed, on LinkedIn, on anywhere. So would you say automate and or outsource was kind of synonymous here? I, I think I would say automate and outsource and automate and outsource what you either A, don't have time for, what you B, if you were to do it, but someone else were to do it, they were going to get a much better result than you were to. That's when you especially outsource. Automate is, I guess, a little bit different, but yeah, ma mainly outsource, um, especially, for example, I don't run ads. As much as I am very good at email marketing, I'm good at creating sales processes, funnels, uh, many, many different skill sets within marketing. I don't create my own ads. So actually, I'm soon here hiring Frank Kern's ad agency because while I know he's good stuff, I work with the organization. I know they're really good people. By the way, a quick shout out to Voltaire. Look up Voltaire Frank Kern. Uh, hire him for ads. He's absolutely amazing. Okay, let's go to delegate. What's something you delegated that has really moved the needle for you? Um, my own email marketing. As much as I, I like my strongest skill set, my love is by far email marketing. Because writing and getting emotion from writing and from being able to just, I don't know what it is. Like I said, I have, I've written two books. I've done a lot of writing in my life. I've read a lot of books. Writing is my go-to and my extremely good at it in most cases. Um, I actually have a neighbor, a neighbor who lives across the street from me, who I chatted with. He has two dogs. I have my dog. We were both, our dogs were both going out, you know, going potty. And I chatted with him and he needed, uh, he needed someone, some kind of work, some kind of job because he's in the middle of working that out. And I said, well, Hey, if I taught you, would you possibly be interested in management email marketing? Cause I'm realizing that even though I love the craft, again, my time is much, much better spent actually doing different activities such as podcasts, partnerships. That's where my time should almost strictly be other than managing people. That's it. That's it. So he's doing a great job and that's going amazing because I want to have him go through an entire course of my own, which I, I make some pretty good courses. Um, and two, I had him come over a few times, work with him one-on-one -on -one, Here's how I do this. Here's how I write my style. And as you work with someone, you kind of learn how to duplicate their style over time. So unfortunately, my email marketing is not, it's not me. You know, once in a while, if I need to do a promo, a special promo, I, I have to kick you aside and I have to write my own. 
But other than that, my email marketing is no longer my own, and soon paid advertising will also no longer be my own. As much as I, as much as I hate it, you're getting a bunch of generals and lieutenants while you uh, ascend. Okay, let's go to eliminate. What's something you completely eliminated that you used to spend time on? I think mainly individual client chasing. That's that's gone. I don't have time for it. There's no way I I could have time for it because. You know, you never want to be, and that's what marketing is for and advertising is for. You never want to be in the convincing game of business. You want to have so much content, so much brand, so much presence out in the marketplace that people see your name and automatically resonate with you, come to you, and they they feel you and want to work with you. So that's why, you know, anything coming from me is usually content. It's podcasts. It's speaking at events, like Go High Level's upcoming event. There's Affiliate World in Budapest, which is going to be insane. Um, events because events, you know, another great example. You're speaking at both. Yes, I'll be, I should be speaking at. I want them waiting for a waiting for a confirmation. Sometimes speaking can get a little tricky. It's like, well, we have these speakers, and you got to sneak in there. I'm pretty good at that. Yeah, I've seen like rosters change up last minute quite often. They can, you know, some people can't make it. Some people change their minds. Sometimes events sometimes have a fee they don't tell you about. Because personally, I'm not going to pay to speak. If I'm coming there. You're paying me to speak, or we're going to have a mutual. Yeah, especially if you're not allowed to pitch on stage, you know, then like that's right. I mean, that's the only circumstance that I would is if even then I usually just go, sorry, no way. And they try to convince me. I don't want to be so associated with that crowd, you know, I don't want to be known as that kind of speaker. Right, right. I've had many people who I've almost gone to speak for. And they even seem like good events or masterminds. Oh, I rented out this, this is my penthouse, and I rented out, and it's it's only five grand. And that's f- I, yeah, you don't want to be associated, but it's just it doesn't seem genuine. It seems like there's something going on. I don't know. I don't like that. It also seems like from the tickets to the event and from what you're doing at the event, you should feel the manager. So it makes you a profit, not just from the speakers. You bring in the speakers as a, I have this expert talent that wants to work with you and help all of you. I've paid them because I believe so much in how strong their education, their materials is. I've brought them in and I'm willing to pay a dollar to bring these people in because I care about you as an audience so much. And yeah, so yeah. Anyone want me to speak? It's either you're paying me or it's going to be free and we're going to make out. I'm okay with some kind of JV deal or, you know, I'll, I'll help sell tickets. So I'll do some PR runs, etc. But yeah, you got to be careful with your time. You got to be careful with people because for some reason, all of the ones that want you to pay have ended up being weird. So to say. Yeah, they're, they're basically, I think the positioning is wrong because what they're saying is that uh, you're paying to rent our authority and you're a nobody is the feeling I get when they ask me to pay. And that kind of doesn't make me feel like very uh, honored. No, no. It makes you kind of go, I don't want to speak for you at all now. I'd actually rather not speak for you. So I'm... But then I can see how some people who, you know, they might be up and coming or maybe they just don't have like a PR presence. And then they get to get the photos on the stage. They get to see, you know, like... It, and it does do a certain bit of authority building. Like, let's say you do a half hour talk and they cut that into a bunch of shorts and reels. And now you have this kind of authority piece. And I can see that could be worth it as a PR move if you don't already have that stuff or if it's important to you. But that's the only value I see in it, really. Two two ways. For me, it's it's kind of like a PR authority appeal. It really is. That's what a lot of, I'll be honest, that's what a lot of that type of stuff is, a lot of it. Uh, but also number two, in my opinion, I think it's also only worth it if you know how to actually network. And like, I don't like that term because it's used in so many ways. It's almost like mo- it's a motivation. very, very broad term. It's a very <laughs> broad term. It means so many different things to so many different people. And what I mean by network is like, you know, again, it comes back to like genuineness. Like when I go to events, usually, even if I'm quiet, I end up making friends with like five or 10 people there. People eventually, because I try to be as considerate caring i actually ask questions because i actually want to learn about people what they do etc you do that so much because um the the saying goes people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care you do that so much when you actually go to events you can make really humongous deals from them but that's going to be by second hand so for example it's about follow-up too from after the events um but yeah building that connection for someone who could be a jv partner someone could be an affiliate for you for your brand it could be a variety of different things. It could be, oh, you run an agency and my agency I'm paying is going to be six grand a month and you guys are only 2,500 because we're homies. You know, there, there's different ways you can go to events or you're going to an event either selling from stage or you connect with people and you can offer some kind of product and service to them in a variety of ways. Yeah, that's the only two ways. 
otherwise, yeah, once you build kind of an authoritative brand, I'm not high in paying you. Sorry. No way. Makes sense. All right. Here's something that uh, you put out on Speaker Hub. It says, traditional business scaling is dead. If you want to grow exponentially, you need to follow the 8.4x profit formula. I like that. It's basically all actually around mainly follow up. Well, the offer is... What is 8.4x? What is that? Uh, the 8.4x, what I calculated, our profit margin was with my dad's affiliate marketing business. And this was probably when I was 18, 19. Because we always have paid very little for advertising, very little for leads. And always been like, how much profit are we actually making You know, overall? If we count all of our expenses, everything laid out completely accurately. We count um, the total revenue, a bunch of different factors. And we uh, summarized, we had about 8.4 times profit. And we're also like, we need to spend a lot more money to scale because all of this profit what are we doing with it? Um, so that's where the number comes from. And what high profitability my mind comes down to, number one is having, you got to have a few elements in play. Number one, you have to have a great sales process. You have to have a really strong, good offer. I actually don't believe in unique offers, like having a unique selling proposition. There's only so many companies that are going to have that. And you don't need that. What you actually need is really good marketing, really good follow-up and a really good sales process. Um, to outperform anyone. Like look at Liquid Death. While they have a very unique can, you know, it's in the end, their offer is still water. But they're now a multi-billion dollar company, one of the biggest water companies in the world. Now they had, what do they have? Definitely the coolest one. That's true. They definitely have the coolest, I guess the brand can, brand slash marketing design. Definitely the coolest yeah, one. I mean, coolness but, is just brand is all it is. Yeah, yeah. It's literally brand. And I used to not believe in brand. We can talk about that. I used to, like that's brand doesn't exist. Um, but oh man, I, you, you Dude. <laughs> I slowly am realizing it's it's huge. Um, GoPro, come on, man. Right. Red Bull. You read all of them. All of them, literally. Um, what makes your offer perform better than anyone else's, from my experience, I think it is in the follow-up, but people think follow-up means, hey, here's my deal again. Hey, here's my discount again. Hey, here's my offer. Oh, we're going to add on a bonus. It all comes back to the same place. It really does. It all comes back to how you actually relate with people. And the best way I'll give like an exact strategy of what I do with follow-up to make any offer perform exceedingly well is what you do is you take your three biggest objections because the biggest reason people die is because they have some kind of objection, whether it's price, whether it's, I don't really trust the company. I don't have enough like known trust, you name it. It's one of their objections they have. That's keeping them from buying or you're just not in front of their eyes enough. So what you want to do with follow-up, if you're a company, whether it's B2B, B2C, it does not matter. What I prescribe is you take those three objections and you build out three custom VSLs, nurturing-based, value-based, individually that are sent out in your follow-up. Say you have a a nine-day campaign. You're going to follow up with all of your leads over a nine-day series, three emails per VSL. All of the follow-up emails, or it could be text, it could be direct messages, it could be any variation, direct to the focused in those three messages towards that VSL. So for example... The one VSL is literally just why you created your company and why you care so much about your customers. You will go above and beyond to get them the exact results they're looking for, no matter what it takes. I can't name right now a single company that does that, that has a single VSL just like that. Not one. So do you do this for your clients? Yes. Yeah, okay. The, we got to talk later because it sounds okay, really, okay. really intriguing. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I hope we do talk later. Real quick, how well it outperforms. When I, we've been in the affiliate contest, me and my dad, Richard. We've outsold people who have literally 10 times to 20 times the size of email lists we have. So at the time, let's say we were promoting a product. This watch is one from an affiliate contest or a, a long-term affiliate program. People who oh, have- Oh, wait, can you tell me what watch it is? Just, it, just because you, it's know, not too you mentioned fancy. it. It's not you too fancy. Up. What is it? It's a Bolova. I'm not a huge watch guy, but I want to start. It's a nice Bolova. To me, a nice, clean look, nothing fancy. It just- Clean appeal. And I get lots of compliments. It's And when you win it, it feels better than if you buy it, doesn't it? Oh. Like if I went and bought a Corvette, you know, it's a transaction. But if I win a Corvette, that's significance. Because it means I'm good. I'm good. I'm so good. I don't perform. I'm this good. You know, (laughs) I'm this this good. (laughs) I'm this good. Yeah. And long story short, what we did was we outperformed people like, uh, for example, Mike Filsame. Mike Filsame is a huge. So you know who he is. He has a big list, no? Yeah. I mean, he's he is an OG. He's he's uh early days, it's the syndicate, all that. 
yeah, Inskip, Butterfly Effect, etc. We've outperformed him in the affiliate contest. We've outperformed many other people in almost every affiliate contest for people who are, oh, like we'd see them on the leaderboards. Oh, oh, we're like, oh, there's no way. We can't beat them out. And then... It's with that, that system that you just described. With that system. And we go above and beyond that, though. So what? I'll, I'll go through the system. I'll cover the little additional little extras. So let's say a nine-day sequence. You build these three emails, send them to these specific sales pages covering objections, which is, again, a lot around feeling and actually building connectivity, not even really selling. Selling is the last thing you do because people will naturally buy if they actually have legit real trust with you. So what we do is we build it out. One, the first video is round, like I said, Here's why we obsess. We obsess over our customers and we will do anything to get you as a customer because here's what we do for this. Here's what we do for this. Complete kind of like a, a lot of my hypothesis on how I do follow up in email marketing and general business is for people to buy is they have to like and like, know, and trust you, the product and service and the company being represented. If those are all there, it's almost impossible for them not to buy from you. Along with also frequency of follow-up, which is a whole nother thing. There's so many things we can go with just follow-up alone. The second three emails though, and the second sales VSL, of course, can go through the strongest, maybe you do have a really strong USP, you have a really strong benefit, or you go through the exponential benefit. So this isn't just PR. This is making you be seen as an instant authority in front of all of your ideal customers and to get them to buy and work. You you know, I'm just going off with an instant pitch in my head. Well, there's so many ways you can phrase and pull at the strongest benefit or the strongest pain point. You can, like I said, I said earlier, three main objections. You can play around with pleasure points too, but objections usually just perform better. So again, also you go with pricing. It could be a whole 20 minute talk on, okay, so our, my consulting costs you $10,000 a month or $20,000 a month and 10% of your revenue. Actually, I don't know their name, so I can't say their name. I have a potential consulting gig next week. This guy flies into two other guys in New York. They uh, work with basketball players, 16, 18 years old, these kids. I don't even know what they sell but it's a potential deal that's working out literally right now. And I'm working out how to price it, how to structure all these different things. And I've talked through in my head, well, how do you lay that out? Because there's so many different ways you can lay out pricing and you don't want to be in the begging or the asking game. You want to be in the, what I'm going to do for you is so exponential for the growth of your business that you'll want to pay me double or triple, quadruple what I'm going to charge you because of the growth I'll bring your company for the next five to 10 years. So you could do a whole VSL, 20 minute VSL, just on that. You could do a whole VSL just on so many of these different points. So you choose three of the ones that you think are going to perform best with your audience. And you could technically test it by doing, you can do some surveys and different things to test it out before you do it. And then additionally, what works really good in my experience is doing like those skits. So take a look at what uh, Billy Jean has done. Take a look at some of Cardone, his is less skits. Take a look at what the Hummer Brothers done and shoot a 10 minute skit of you have two options. You're Morpheus. It makes marketing and business fun. It, it really does. So I, I can show you my phone. I have where I go, you have two options. A, you don't become a customer with me. Your lead generation is pitiful. You know, your business is never growing. Your profitability is like what? A 2.5 times ROI. But if you do the red pill, oh, imagine having a 4X ROI. You're able to hire and train and pay your employees. You know, there's so many ways you can phrase it. And, you know, I did like, I had the right lighting. You can get really creative with it and you stack those. You can do that. Actually, you could do that between, you could do three, you could do something humorous. You could do three, something entertaining, three. It, anyone listening, try just one. Do make one, because most businesses don't have a second sales page or like a second for their main offer. Structure one or two different variations 10 to 20 minutes long of something A, that is really humorous, entertaining, some kind of skit, or B, nail down a hammer down on just one pain point, one pleasure point, or something with your customer, you will see infinitely higher conversions. I I would guarantee my entire career on it. Like there's nothing that beats that 100%. John, I would be extremely disappointed if I don't see a follow-up email from you after this podcast. I'd be like, (laughs) like... Like, I'm so disappointed. Like, John, John is low. You're not. <laughs> You're going to get a customer. You're going to get a video it. now. You're getting a video now. I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it. All right. Last thing, and we got to wrap this up. Uh, so this is a presentation you did at AdWorld, right? And something you said is an omni-channel marketing strategy is an optional. It's mandatory if you want to dominate your industry. Yes. Yeah, so with the age of AI and just as, as over time, again, I, and I can say I've kind of watched as business has changed over the past 10 years. 
you know, selling and actually doing a business, I believe was technically easier, quote unquote, especially for small business owners, because there wasn't 300 agencies or 500 agencies. And, you know, there's probably a thousands of agencies in the United States at this point. There was not the same amount of competition as the internet has changed. And as people have gotten more online than they ever have before, there is an inundation of people selling online. You know, there wasn't a thousand soap brands, all these different things. So the, the, there's so much competition online. There's so many people who are following up more often and better with your leads and customers. There are so many more advertisements being seen on radio. Which, I mean, radio kind of exists, but still, that, it depends who you are. On podcasts, on TV, on your phone, in every variation and format possible. There was so much going on in the world with wars, with all types of craziness. I won't even speak about. There's so much going on, in my opinion, especially with AI and everything going on. If you want to grow, you want to scale. You want high profit margins and you want the secondary effect of having time, more time freedom. You want to leave a legacy for your children, for your family and have an actual impact in this world. You must have what I call it, like you're saying, omni-channel tactics all in place because you're competing against as well. Not even everything I just said stacks upon you're also competing with companies and businesses that have a much larger budget than you, that have much larger teams than you that have so many more resources. So to actually compete, especially if you want to grow a very successful business, your ads, your follow-up through, like I don't just follow up usually through text or email or through calling. If I want a really successful campaign, I'm following up through all of them plus Messenger, plus as many sources of, of follow-up as possible. Because real quickly, for a really good follow-up strategy that converts, like you want every lead becoming a customer, you have to follow up from a variety of perspectives and methods. So methods is texting, calling, emailing, and the perspectives is humorous, pain-based, pleasure-based, etc. cetera. Um, so from your, to get back to the whole concept of, of omni-channel, I think if you want your business to grow, you need your sales process needs to be fine-tuned. You need to be split testing it. You need to be optimizing it. You need to be split testing, optimizing your checkout cards. You need to be split testing, optimizing your, your lead gen, whatever you're using for a lead magnet or for opt-in pages. You need to do that as well for your advertising. You need to do that as well for your email marketing, your other follow-up, all of these different things. And it sounds like a very difficult task. And it, number one, it kind of is in some cases, but that's why you automate, delegate, do some of these other things. And you have to hand off some of these projects because your time can't possibly be spent. And maybe you need to do additional hiring. Maybe you need to expand your team. I know expanding your team costs money, but it really doesn't because if you hire the right person, especially in the right role, you're going to generate a lot more than that person is being paid. That's the purpose of employees is to expand the business and reach more customers, do it more profitably, hire, train better, pay better, grow, grow, grow. Um, so just kind of a last message on that. A, if you want your business to grow and grow very well, especially in today's market, especially with what AI people have no clue what AI is going to do. Like it's, it's insane. Um, before the next 10 years go by, fine tune, optimize your follow up, your sales process, your ads, your lead gen, all that stuff. Try to make this biggest deals possible. And also by doing it omni channelly, what you do is you're, you're exposed as well in multiple different avenues to your leads, to your customers, to your audiences. That's why big brands are able to do what they do. And they have kind of general commercials that reach out to the public. Other than they have a brand, other than they have established lead and customer flow among many other factors is you see them literally everywhere. So they are literally embedded their brand in your head because they have made you feel a certain way. All goes back to feeling in some way. That's what I believe. Um, so you have to almost become a brand. And if you can do that, you can do that well, in an optimized and high converting way, your business is going to. I love that. I got one last question, but before I ask it, I, I want to say something about the experience I've had with this conversation with you so far. You know how you said you you trust people and you're willing to pay money with people once you see their personality, right? Once you see their style, their breadth of knowledge and experience. And throughout this last you know hour of speaking with you, we've done just that. And I feel like I trust you because I think that a lot of people can bullshit their way through stuff. But when I spring questions on you that are not necessarily a part of the narrative and you could go deep in any direction, I'm like, okay, I think that this guy's actually done all these things. And when people give vague answers, when you go off of their, their narrow little, you know, narrative, it's not a red flag, but it's an orange flag. Like, yeah. So real quickly on that, this is just, this is not business. Huh, here business. we go again. Let's <laughs> here do we it. go again. I, I dabble in many avenues. I try to master as much as possible. So 
people, when you're listening to this and, and you're having a conversation with someone and what he's saying is 100% true and you sense something is off, whether it's like you're saying, like he didn't answer that question as thoroughly as he should have. He didn't go into like a story. He didn't go into a, an avenue. Those senses are actually, from my experience, I always think about like, has that sense ever been off? I, I can't think of maybe two times. You know what I do love is when I asked you to give a specific example of something you eliminated, you didn't have a perfect answer. And that tells me that you actually were thinking about your real experiences. And that's when I was just like, ah, I like it. Like you could have bullshitted it. Like I eliminated alcohol. Like it, it, anybody could have said something that sounded perfect, but because it was imperfect, I thought it was real. And and that's what another lesson of, of why genuineness and feeling works so well is because the perfectionism of being a professional is a lot of times bull and people see that that's why if you do a mix like i've worked with some i've almost hired some very professional people like there's a a pr agency that gets you on podcasts um versus in-house i'm like yeah i'll I'll talk to them and they wouldn't give me pricing i'm like i don't care about the price i'm like just just give me the price well we don't do that on this call the way we do it that sign and i also got a feeling people i'm telling you when you get that sign about people or interactions it's i don't know what it is i don't know if it's the universe i don't know if it's god i don't know what it is the feeling is usually right and you need to trust it. And I've gotten that more and more with meeting people with, with especially considering hi- hiring it to be very careful, with especially agencies. Um, people literally look up testimonials and contact the people. Are you going to spend a lot of money? Um, that right there is a value bomb. Like you see the testimonials on the page, actually contact them. And the worst is when there's a first name and an initial. I'm just like, oh, come on. Oh, well, actually, it does get worse. It does get worse. You see stock images. That's the- St- stock image. That's the worst. The best I've seen is when they're not afraid to link to the person or their website. That's when you go, okay, you actually linked, you know, because a lot of times testimonials are given and there's no link. It's like saying it's name, initial, and then I got $10 billion return in two months and I couldn't more highly recommend. I actually tell people real quickly, I tell people for testimonials. I say, I, I never mentioned like I generated you X revenue. I mean, I have some like that, but a lot of times I tell them and they just spit out that I go, just say, Hey, I had a really pleasant experience working with John. He's a really ethical and like honest, transparent, real dude, because and that's why I preach is people resonate more with that than, you know, a uh, gorilla agency got me a 10, 15 billion ROI. I want real human connection. I think most people want real human connection. All right, let's wrap this up. Here's my final question. Because I, I sense that you have a breadth of knowledge around business in general. So this is going to be a business in general kind of question. But one of the things I was going to say, I was going to bring up, but uh, I skipped because we're running out of time, is something you said is, uh, at Speaker Hub, is stop wasting your money on new customers. And uh, I'm going to kind of weave this in here, is your business owner in the services space. That means uh, agency, coaching, education in general, online. And you are... At the seven figure mark, you're struggling to get to like the upper seven figures, like five to 10 million a year. In your experience, what have you seen as the one thing that moves the needle the most for people in that range? Yeah, I'm I'm thinking on the projects like the one I told you with John Cristani right now. I think, I hate to say, there's so many different things that I, I think are important. It's hard to tackle them all. I will narrow it down to... Truly, I will say, A, two, two things. I'll come up with the second once I'm done with the first. The first one, I think, is overall, your entire customer experience, you have to obsess over. Like, you literally have to fine-tune from your support to when people are dealing with calls, whether it's a sales team that you have, whether it's just a support call, whether it's a quality check, it doesn't matter, whether it is your ad whether it is your funnel, whether it is any part of what someone goes through, you have to make sure that they are like, they are the goal. They are everything. Walmart, when they say the customer is right, it sounds tacky and it is tacky, but when you treat that as so in every aspect, your entire business changes because for example, like with with John Castani or any kind of higher profile people you work with, like, you, some of your your concerns as a business owner change, like chargeback rates and refund rates to what you're being charged by your payment processor to a variety of different things can affect the entire business. For example, like when I was working with Frank Kern and he 
he changed a headline. The one headline changed the entire conversation with the sales floor by like 20% conversions, which at scale, when you're having hundred to hundreds of sales calls a week, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars in business gone. Um, so I, I think everyone right now, a lot of times, especially if you're, if you're successful, I think you get stuck in my business is doing good and it's just going to keep growing. Like I have plenty of money. I have a nice house. I have a nice car. My family's doing good. I can take care of something happens. I'm good. The business is good. I think you have to think and realize it's not, it can be a lot better. And I mean, seriously, hyper optimize and tighten up everything. Add to app opt-in page to the bridge pitch to your sales page to every single email they get afterwards. Like when I make a really fine tune a campaign, I split testing everything from my ads to ad variations to the optimum. I mean, everything is being split tested constantly because especially over time, if you don't do that, you're going to see other people who are doing it outperform you. And like I said, I think a lot of people get stuck in that range. Just I'm, I'm good. I'm doing like my business. I have a great business. I'm doing, I'm huge. I, this is amazing. You get stuck in my business is good. And you have to really focus on not squeezing. I don't like that term, but getting as much profitability as possible. Um, two, focusing on, I mean, seriously, the customer experience, especially support alone can reduce chargebacks, can reduce refunds, can reduce all of that substantially. And then also follow up with retaining customers, which is the king. Customer retention, by the way, is the king of all metrics. We can go into that alone, especially if you're high ticket and services and you want to retain customers. I've had many agencies. I'm like, after all the, where you have your churn rate, send them a, a, like a hundred dollar to a few, like a thousand dollar gift in person or send them a personalized. None of them will do that. I'm like, you're costing yourself. It's a cost. No, you're costing yourself three to six to nine to 12 to 24 months worth of service with that person that you're going to lose because it doesn't take that much to just with faith alone and loyalty alone to keep someone as a customer. Well, last thing I'll squeeze in with the SEO agencies, we spent $50,000 within like four months. We got highway robbed. Um, but it was our own fault. One, because we didn't do what I said about testimonial, but two, because we trusted the people so much, this is why you have to one measure stuff and make sure everything of yours is fine tuned. Um, we didn't do our due diligence in learning about them, learning about the previous clients. And we also liked them so much. That's the only counter to building a strong relationship. We liked them so much as people were like, they wouldn't not get us results. They wouldn't try to extend this contract as long as possible. Would they? So people even like me, I'll warn you have to seriously get a deep sense of if they're genuine and if you're going to hire, whether it's people, whether you're hiring an agency or anyone consulting consultant, doesn't matter. Dig deep. And can I leave you with three quotes or do you want me to, you say something? Okay. I have three quotes. I'm sorry. This is probably a longer episode than normal, but we had an amazing conversation. I came up with these when I was young and I love them. And I think they're still true today. The first one is aspire for progress, hunger for success and strive for greatness which the obvious is right there. The second is your attitude is not defined by your life. Your life is defined by your attitude, which basically means you decide. That's my, yeah, you, you decide how you interpret your world and that decides, I mean, everything else. Um, most people have it the other way around. And then become all that you can so that all you despise doesn't become all that you live by which means live to your fullest potential because you don't have anything better to do. And if you do it and you just try, life is such a, a glorious and amazing experience that you are just privileged to be able to live. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. I think those could be t-shirts or posters or both. You, you need it. a merch store, man. That's <laughs> I, what you need. I've thought about it. I might. <laughs> <laughs> All right, John. Thank you so much, guys. Because you listen to the end, I, it tells me obviously that there was something about this that you appreciated and that you found value in. Check out the links below if you're on YouTube, if you're listening on the podcast, look at the show notes, find and explore everything about John. And uh, John, thank you for being on the show, providing maximum value. And for everybody else, I'll see you next week. No hustle, worship here, we're a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Cause the old ways fade, new stories to be told. So content capitalists, get to the prize.